And we are back with another episode on the cutest road to Nirvana. This is episode 30, and today I am joined by Amy. That's what you said. Hi, nice <laughs> <to see you. laughs> Vicky. Hello. Charlie. Hello. Uh, admire. Hello, hello. Lesejo. Hello. And Siobiwe. Hello. I hope I didn't leave anybody else. Um, uh, at my seat, you got two hellos. <laughs> this episode, we will be doing a look at open source geo, the open source geospatial stack and Node Red workflows. And the session will be presented by Vicky. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand over the, um, the microphone, virtual microphone, to you, Vicky, and let you get on with it. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. So, hi everyone again, and we'll be going through two workflows that we recently added to the OSGS stack. And the first one will be how to get data from a post, uh, Postgres database and display it on the dashboard. So, I already um, have some example data that I got uh, from the Open Weather API, which will be adding to, to our GIS database. Um, so it's a, uh, it, there are two schemas, actually. There's the weather data schema and the world air quality schema. I will be showing it once we run, we're able to connect to the database. So starting off, we have to, um, the basics of Node-RED are it's sort of a low-code environment, and we use these nodes that you can see here on the left-hand left side of our workspace to act as um, the code that we'll be using to, to carry out the tasks that we want. So the basic ones are the inject node and the debug node. The debug node is what we use to display the output of our code on this debug console. And the inject node is what we usually use to manually trigger our flows. Our, I'm sorry, our flows. The first thing we will do is add a Postgres node um, from this storage category onto our workspace. And we'll use this uh, node to connect to our um to our uh, gis database so you can double click on this to open the edit um the edit uh, dialog and then here on the server properties you can now add our postgres connection um here we'll just name our host and add the username and then the password is the Postgres password you get from your ENV file. Uh, let me just get it real quick and post it here. Then the make sure you, you check the use SSL checkbox here and then we just add our connection and we can name the label our node as PB. And the next thing is now querying this database. Now, uh, to query this database in Node-RED, you need to arrange your SQL queries as an array in our message payload. And the message payload is usually the output of from one node to another. So here we'll add our function node. And the first thing we want to do is select all the rows in our weather data table. So the first thing is uh, the message payload is equal to an array. array and
I forgot to add the brackets to make it a query. Right. Syntax is really important here. And here we have our message uh, query in an array in the message payload. And we are done. And we can also name this label our nodes. So here's the select data from table. We're done. The next step is to now connect all these nodes together in order to display the output from our message payload. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, you must check this receive query output in order to be able to pass the message payload from the database, I mean the Postgres node to the message payload. And now we'll deploy a flow and manually trigger the flow. Oops. And yeah, there's an error there. I think I need to think the, there's a spelling error probably in there. Oh. Let me try that again. Okay, just a quick debug session. Just see whether my death is in there. Always. <laughs> yeah. Um, Live demos always work the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, we, we are only seeing your browser, so I don't know if you're doing stuff in your database um, that you want oh, to be yeah. showing us or not. Um, it might be quite oh, nice to see right. how you're actually doing that. Okay, let me change the screen share mode that I think I used. The window only, okay. Also, I don't know if you can zoom in on the browser when you, like other people viewing the video might be able to see a bit better if you zoom in. I don't know if Node Red grows a bit funny when you try zoom in there. Okay, so you can so see- We can see uh, your terminal. Okay, yeah. cool. So just making a DB shell in the PSQL shell in the database. And yeah, I want to see- Just hide your sharing bar if you don't mind as well, thanks. Oh yeah. And just want to see what the all the schemas are there. Okay, that's in. And then what tables are in the whether that's a schema. Yeah, it is there. So I wonder what's going on. Oh yeah. Rookie mistake. I left the database as Postgres <laughs> instead of GIS. <laughs> okay, um, you can deploy it again, and yeah, we have it. So it brings all the rows as an array, and then each array, I mean, each element of the array is, this, is one of the, is a row in the table. So we have all of our temperature data for Nairobi for a few dates that I picked up from the Open Weather API. And the next step now is to display the data on a table. So in order to get the table node, we need to install uh, the module from the manage, if that's the correct word, manage palette and we move to the install tab and search for the table module. Did you have to do this for the Postgres node that you used to, to get that? Because it's not there by default, is it? Oh, no. Um, this I used the hack, the hack thing, uh, Timput, where we, we installed it from directly from Git, because the, uh, okay. the upstream one does not work well with SSL connections. Okay, all right. Well, apparently it's fixed now. The guy on my patch in the um, 
the node uh, repo, he uh, said, okay, I don't think my patch is needed because he's fixed it independently of my patch. So it um, could be that you could just grab it from straight from the, the gallery. Oh, cool. But if that's the case. <laughs> because I don't <laughs> no. know. Really yeah, in the case, it will just install it the same way. So um, this is the table. And the one I use is this uh, table, this node UI table module. And just install that. Yeah, and it's done. And you can see it's there's a new dashboard category added here. And you can just grab that and add it here. And connect here. So that means the message payload from this node is passing also to this node. And then we can configure our dashboard from here. Oh. Mm, I'm just this always happens. Um, a little bit. Sometimes I need to reload it and accept the SSL again. So to get this node to work. I'm just at it again. Hmm. And I am stumped a bit because it yeah, worked so yesterday. So it's not giving the properties for the table? Or? Yes. Yeah. It's supposed to give properties and doesn't seem to have it. What about now. the enabled button at the bottom? Is it just double click it again? Mm. I mean, go into it again. At the bottom there, is it enabled? Yes, it is enabled. I think Toggle maybe. Enabled on and off and see if it makes any difference. I think, if I remember correctly, that was a trick of. Let me just adding the dashboard. I think you have to add the dashboard module also. So those are the dashboard modules and close. Yeah. So I think it only works if you have dashboard dashboard modules also installed. So here we'll add um, we'll be adding a dashboard tab and a dashboard group. So we'll leave our dashboard we can leave it named as home or just add rename it to weather data then we can name now the group for which the table will belong to and this will be the display weather data and we can add that in and then we are will now have to add manually add the columns for the data and so we have we can choose which columns we want to present so i'll pick the day zero is the current what temperature data for that particular day it was observed and then day seven is the seventh day forecast for the temperature. So we can pick um, the message. The easier way is to copy the path and then we can add it here. So it's always message payload. Um, message payload day zero and the message payload day seven. and we can add current we can label it current weather 
Humbly bullet the A seven four crest. Just check you left the message dot in the front of the second property. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um, done. And this connection. And so I. And to access the dashboard, you have to use the name of the host and just you add the UI at the end. Um, and you have to trigger the one. And now we can, once we see the table, we can now edit the layout of how it looks like. And we use the dashboard sidebar, add the layout. Then just expand the table a bit and deploy the changes we've made and manually trigger the workflow again. Oh, okay. It's not displaying the actual data. Just need to check that. Once again. Um, probably missing a particular step in this. And we have the. Maybe it's a good time to show how the help system works. <clears throat> okay. Good. Payload, the row. So. Yeah. That's name, age. Um, just expand that a little bit. We've got the payload and we have the name. So Let me have a quick look at what I did previously. Um, sorry, that. Oh yeah, you should. I'm um, not supposed to add the um the message payload on the uh on the message. Just to talk about your syntax that you had a bit there. So you, you were asking, I was letting you debug on your own um, yeah. cruel experiment, but um, your your um, your syntax there says, give me the first row as well. So it would have only like, um, it would have only shown you like the first object from the array with zero being the first, you know. Check it out. Oh yeah, and here it is. We have the current weather and the day seven forecast. And this doesn't give much information without the date. Let me add the date as a column here. Oh, and at the top, it's the observation date. Um, observation date and it done and trigger workflow again and yeah here we have it uh so this is the 
first workflow where we just get uh, data from a table and add it to the node red um, to the dashboard table. Are there any questions so far? If uh, no one else has any questions, <laughs> not necessarily to the workflow, um, I have questions about the kind of data source, data life cycle side of things, um, which I don't know if it's relevant to this topic or it should wait till later. But basically, you know, the, the concept of being able to um, consume that, uh, you know, open weather API, you know, and ingest it into the database. Because th this is just representing a database table as a as like a table on a dashboard, right? Yeah. Um, I mean that's stored in your your Postgres database, mm -hmm. but it comes from an API. So, like in theory, we should be able to like consume an API directly and and use it in a dashboard. Um, and also, you know, how is it being ingested into your database? Are you using a Node-RED workflow, or have you got like another script running? Yeah, I got, actually have a node workflow if I can show you from here. So this is running on my local machine and not my server. So here is how I got the um, the temperature data for, I, I think I run this for 31st December up to the 5th of January. So it's about four, four or five days if I remember correctly. So this is the workflow that I used and it has just the the function node like we used previously and the database node to create the schema initially and also to insert the data. And what's of interest is this uh, HTTP request node that I was using to get data from the Open Weather, open weather Map API. Okay, great. I was just wondering how, how you had done it and like contextualizing for other people who are interested. Um, so basically, you can uh, both consume like generic REST APIs uh, and then just like consume in, them into your database. And then, you know, from that database, you can run analytics or do whatever you need to do, whether it's like triggers or anything. Um, but you can also consume data directly from an API and then add it to a dashboard if you really needed to. Yeah. Great. That, uh, that was my only real question. <laughs> Thanks. Just to just to add there, can you skip the database and just get like from that API? Because I see it retains the JSON object. Can you skip the database and Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I was saying. Direct. You can use it <laughs> you can you can use it to ingest your database, perform mm -hmm. some database analytics and then expose that output as a as a dashboard or you can just go straight from the a api and and use display Node -RED. it's like an interface to build dashboards from like and, and you can use multiple apis so like uh i don't know maybe i'm stealing vicky's thunder here and she can take over the explanation <laughs> <laughs> no 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 please go on uh, it's okay yeah sure so uh, you, you can actually have like multiple api endpoints that you consume into different payloads and then you can add that into like a dashboard table so you can make a single dashboard that like is getting different endpoints and like aggregating the data for you basically okay cool any any other questions uh, maybe do you want to talk about other widgets you know dashboards aren't really limited to just tables right yeah um you can actually use the the, uh, the world map uh, dashboard widget. Um, so you can just display data on, I think it's a, if I'm correct, it's a folium based map. Um, so I got some data from the, a different API, the free weather API to get air quality data and run that flow here. Let me add it. Import it really quickly. From here, um, so let me just deploy that so I can keep those changes there, and then uh, add this. Okay. Um, 
let me add it and then I'll walk you through the build the build process. So to export export a flow from um, from Node-RED, there's this in the main menu, there's this export option. And it allows you to either export from selected nodes or the current flow. And the before that, the current flow is this. So sort of like tabs, tabs on your browser. So you have different tabs open with each on your different flows. And you can just export the current flow as a JSON file and just either download it and it downloads a JSON file or you can use the export and copy to clipboard, which is easier. And we can come now to our onto our other node red instance and add the flow. Bas to me, basically, it's just adding a tab and then import the flow that we copied. So we can copy from the clipboard and paste it there. Or we can use this option to select a file to import from the JSON file that we downloaded previously and imported the current flow and import. Oh, yes, uh, hadn't downloaded the. Here we have it. And for the world map, you also need to download it the dashboard widget. So it's the same process for the previous one. Manage palette and world map. Install that. Yep, here we have it. OK, cool. And uh, yes, because we hadn't installed the world map widget before we imported it. It's yeah, it's connected. So we'll just I sort of divided the workflow into sections. So we'll just start with that. And previous process is the same, except now we have the um, this is what the database looks like. Um, I'm just run it here. The fast table just to have. Yeah, so we have these tables in the world air quality schema. And I use to get this data, I use the same process that um, I just showed for the um, open weather API, except I was using the free weather API. And just to have a look at what the table looks like, you can just use a select statement. Just add a from. Yeah. yeah. So this is what my table looks like. And let's go back here. And the first thing we want to do is add, I, I did for the map was to add a, a drop down menu with the dates just so we can able to display different uh, tables on the map. So we have the inject node, the function node that we use to select the dates from the, um, the table names. Um, just open it for a second. Um, can everyone see it clearly? Yes. Cool. So just use the select statement from here. And we also have the Postgres node and the sort of uh, getting the, uh, the message payload from a uh, from a array format this way into a, a list. I'm not sure if JavaScript still calls this a list, but yeah, um, get that done and then push this to a drop down node. This drop down node that from the to push it to a drop down menu on the dashboard. 
and configure it to now a new dashboard. We won't be using the weather data dashboard. We'll just add another tab here. So we call that the air quality dashboard. And we assign this drop down menu to a group called the select date group and update that. And we can also pass and we can deploy that. And you'll see when we go back to our dashboard that we now have another tab, the air quality tab and trigger this workflow. We now have the dates. Position dates. Just display that on the on the dashboard. It's supposed to display there. Just one. What's coming out in your debug messages? I don't see anything showing me. Yeah, it's not showing anything on the debug message. So just move the debug along back along your workflow until you find where the messages stop coming out. So are dashboards all like compiled into the same dashboard with different tabs or like do you set yeah. up, uh, how do it's you configure all of that? Like can you have multiple dashboards or is it just one dashboard overall or is it per flow or per, per like, like are they grouped in like a, a work group or, or something? Um, for dashboards, you only have one dashboard, but then you can now add multiple tabs for the different flows or different um, data sets that you want to display like it does it's not governed per flow you just have to set the group and the tab properties you can have multiple tabs on the same flow yeah. um, check your database so no, 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 details you've... maybe you've got a cut and paste or something in it You copied it from your local machine to your server, right? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Let's get it. So, let's get from my NP file. Um, Which will have oh, to yeah. change after this session because <laughs> it's going to go kind of online. Yeah. So. I wonder why I keep forgetting that, uh, the difference between my local machine and the server. Um, so yeah, and we can deploy that. Yeah, and now we have the list of dates that we have on, and here we can select it. From here and yeah it's working so this was the first part that I did and then the next part is select using the dates to select data from the from the table so I used a again a function node and a Postgres node to use a select statement from here so this is the I selected the name, the coordinates, and the air quality string, whether it's good, healthy, unhealthy, or hazardous from the database. And this next part is assigning um, is assigning a map icon because the world map 
uh, this node, if we open the properties, accepts um, an icon. You can use a font as some um, icon and you can use an icon color. So in these two sections, um, we created a, a dictionary to sort of select the color and we'll use that function node. So before that, there's a split node and the join nodes. The split nodes sort of split the message payload array into individual elements that allow you to perform whatever changes you want on those individual elements here. And then the join node rejoins everything back into a single array. So this is the function. And here we'll just again assign message payload as the property. The first property is the icon. So we'll do icon is equals to fa map icon. That's from font of some. And the next part is the color. So the icon color for a start, we can sign red and need a red um, hex code. Just copy this in. And label this also map icon, icon, uh, and it done. And then this rejoins it back and can use this message payload to view the changes and connect this to this part. Once we can trigger this workflow and add the select from this tab for the first gen of January and view the object. Now we have uh, the database has 245 rows. So these 245 elements in the array. And now we have a map icon and a map the color for the icon here. At this point, we can now add the world map dashboard. Um, it usually ends up here in the dashboard uh, category and configure it. We have air quality dashboard and where the latitude and longitude we can center it on and the zoom level we can start with. And it's done. And we just deploy that and trigger the workflow again. And here we have it. Can you can you can you restrict the bounding box of that those results or it's strictly for the world map it just to be centered on the world? Like if your result sets are for a specific country? Um, I'm not sure about that, but I think it could be done. What happened is my uh, my data is for like entire the entire all the world capital. So it's OK. Yeah. I think could be a problem with the label of the, the font. On some icons, I think I got the nips, one of the spellings wrong. Oh yeah, it's a map marker. Not an icon. And we can check that again.
Yeah, I'm just trying to preload. Quick, figuring out what's wrong with the map for a second. It should show all the icons here. And I'm just trying that. Um. Could be the icon color is not labeled well. Icon color. Uh. For the record, everything worked fine yesterday, so <laughs> I'm not sure what happened to it, but I'll figure it out in a sec. Uh. At this point, I would like to welcome any ideas on what could be going wrong here. I have this effect on computers, so um, <laughs> even if we're on different sides of the continent, it's, <laughs> so let's it's have good a look at your, let's, let's have a look at your debug um, yeah. and look at uh, each object that you're putting out. So you've got a light long and then just go get, check the docs, make sure you're basically putting out something that matches what the docs say you should be putting out. So you should give it a little bit. Let's go to that top example. Um, the, the, yeah. Yeah. So you need let long. Make sure you didn't put a G in your long. So often people put. <laughs> Just go back to your your debug. Okay. Yeah. Let long. Uh, and the icon and the icon. Color. Um, so again, the world map. The help for the world map. Uh, so I, I normally, when I'm troubleshooting, I use a like. Um, Go back to first principles and start sending it the most simple thing you can first and then add to it later. So um, if you're doing your... What version of font awesome are you using, by the way? Five, I think. Just strip out the icons first, strip out everything that you, other than the points, basically, and, and then you know, add incrementally things back in again. Okay. Move this. Um, yeah. Okay, so then you know that something you're doing in the steps in between are causing a problem, so then you just incrementally add things back in. Yeah. So your split probably not going to cause much problem, but you never know, like just debug the output of this. I think your split is fine because we saw it was, it was creating all messages. Um, so some, one of those icon and color things is doing So just add one at a time, just add a color first maybe. Oh, uh, but where, uh, you didn't return message payload. Okay, yeah. Okay. Just try comment one line out and then. We'll just, yeah, remove that. that. I would have almost started with the color first because it's probably less risk that color breaks things than the icon does. Yeah, the font awesome icons, like the, the names of them change every version. 
unless you're using like a simple one, like map itself would probably be fine, but like there's always different ones, depending on the version you're using, so it can be a bit hinky. Yeah. Okay, so that's your red color working. So you know it's just your icon is causing some issue. Could be the, I think it could be the fact I'm using. You could just try with map or just try to remove the FA prefix, yeah. Um, those are two kind of first steps. So you know that there's, this, I think it was Sherlock Holmes said, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left, no matter how improbable, must be true. <laughs> so yeah. you basically, you eliminate all the things that you know are um, working fine, and then that leaves you one thing left, which is just the icon. Okay, I know the icon doesn't seem like it should be breaking it, but it was breaking it, So because you know that everything else was working. I think what the docs say is usually the FA tag is supposed to make um, without the added sort of tooltip. So it's just the smaller icons because it's like really huge. But I guess that's not working on this one. It's probably like a, a class thing in CSS. So it might be FA space and then the name of the icon. Uh, it just kind of depends on the implementation that they're using for that particular widget. Um, more than likely, all the version of the font also will have like different requirements. And the, um, that that node map uh, world map widget's got a, its own website, which has got much more detailed docs as well. If you um, yeah, if you go in there, you might find extra information. Um, yeah, they use the font icon name or the weather light icon. Yeah, if you use the FA prefix, you'll get the icon on its own. Otherwise, it looks let me just try that again. And is it an issue, or we should get the latest icons, probably? That could work. The, that where it says font awesome in their docs, it probably links to the specific version that they're using in that widget. Um, so, like, you'll be able to tell from there, but oh, there you can I think see. map. You have this FA, FA map marker. Just step one would be paste that into a text editor first <laughs> or, or type it out because, like, it could include Unicode characters or anything um, from the actual web page. When you copy from the web page, it's not necessarily just the text that you're copying. It could be invisible characters or like, you know, a different value for space. So like lots of things can go wrong when copying and pasting like that. I don't think you need the first FA in front, but let's see. Yeah, without FA. So, so try all. their example, which is FA mail, FA dash mail, because again, if you like, 
um, if you're getting a known working solution from them, then you can so see if the thing's actually working. Because if this doesn't work, then their thing's broken. Because you know, they've told you you can use this. Well, all their documentation's out of date. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not everybody keeps it up to date. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so so now you know that okay, the the docs are actually working, but then there's something now specifically with that icon. So they try a different font I awesome icon and see if it's specific to that map marker one. Where you're just basically eliminating you can try map pin. Yeah. Map map that dash pin. We'll put like a map pin in there. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's particularly to that map icon. Yeah, here are the pins. <laughs> Great. Either that or like, I mean, you could have copied and pasted from the wrong website, which had like the different character for dash. <laughs> Strange things happen, but uh, yeah, it, I think that's at least working and, and usable now. Yep. Does it have pop-ups? Can you click on them? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Nice. And using that logic flow, you could color code the pins according to the, um, the air quality. Yeah, it's an exercise yeah I had the dictionary somewhere. I think I... Uh, okay. No. I have to go find it. I had placed the one, the original. Um, I think I lost the original particular node for this. But there's a dictionary that allows you to uh, color code this. Uh, we can actually do it now. So, um, the colors are um, I have to find the red. Yeah, so this is the in color code I was using for that. So the green, good, moderate, unhealthy, or sensitive groups. Or is there someone who knows the hex codes of, of head for the colors? Depends on your on the color. Um, I know, red, Tim's green, actually quite an expert at working it out. <laughs> <laughs> but use a color picker; it's the easiest. Yeah. Yeah, the color picker is my friend as well. So whatever color I need, I just go and pick it up. <laughs> yeah. I missed one, moderate. Moderate. Yeah. That would be And the healthy sensitive. Hope I get the taps correctly. That would be orange. The weird thing is when I move across the same color, the code seems to change. Which? Is 
this is unhealthy. Yeah. We'll have a section the titled uh, Victorious Load Typing. I have some elevator music somewhere in my laptop here. <laughs> oh, that would be great for it about now. I think we need the backup singing uh, choir to, to join in. the I could set the icon color to message um yeah the color deck message you know that thing. That's it. I'm doing this here. Mm -hmm. um, we're done. Did I lose the dashboard? Okay. And Forgot to trigger that, and yep, here we have them color coded. Mm, nice. Well done. They're very cool. Mm -hmm. They kind of look like lollipops. I love it. <laughs> yep. And the yeah, the correct unhealthy, good, and moderate. Yeah. So that's it for the two flows that I had worked on for the um, for the stack. Uh, are there any questions for Stokova? Sometimes when you want people to ask questions, you must ask the specific person what questions <coughs> do you have because they're a bit shy to tell you their questions. Like pick on somebody. <laughs> Like, Abby, do you have any questions? <laughs> no, not at the moment. I don't have any questions. So, so that color dictionary defined is that the only way that you can define colors? Isn't there something much more flexible that allows you to do automatic classifications? That not that I've seen, especially for if I was picking the colors from a specific uh, structure. Like, the, like, like, like a color ramp or something where you could hmm. just allow <laughs> distinct colors to be selected from there. Could be. We can actually find that out now. Yeah, there is, I think this is a color picker. Right. I don't think that's going to do quite what um, Admire was after. He was looking for some like um, thing where you give it an input value and it gives you an output color. Yeah. 
but surely you can um, make one in like create your own nodes as well if you <laughs> if needed a lot. They're quite simple to make, I think. So, right. Edmar um, is going to design a SLD import <laughs> 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 to link it directly with QGIS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe just before we wrap up the session, Vicky, we could just talk about some of the limitations of um, Node Red, especially the dashboarding part, because not immediately obvious that when you create these dashboards, um, it's only designed for a single user. That is to say, if, for example, if Vicky's on the on the dashboard and she changes the, the, the date in the date picker, everybody who's got the dashboard open on their browser will see that state change. So that is a bit limiting because you you know you you can basically make public dashboards if they're read only, but if you're trying to make things where people interact with them. Each session doesn't get their own state. Uh, the state is shared between all the sessions, which could also be like a, um, something useful if, if that, like if you've got a specific use case where you want everybody to be able to change the state. But I think in general, you want to have like per user's log, uh, you know, browser page. You want to have the state like isolated. Um, so for that reason, I although I played around with the dashboards a lot, I don't really use them too much because. Um, for the client work I've been doing, like they, they don't want to have everybody being able to change the state for everybody else. Um, but that said, even if you ignore the dashboard parts, this workflow thing is extremely useful because you can basically just hook it up to any kind of inputs and outputs and do some data processing with it. So like in my, in my instance of the OSGS, I've got my own tracks data getting processed through a, a flow like this, and it basically pulls the data out of the MQTT um, messaging bus with a mosquito, um, I'm using mosquito on the back end, which is like a messaging server. So my phone sends the messages to the messaging server, and then um, Node Red picks it up off the message bus, and then does some processing of it, and then pushes it into a database. And then um, I've got this, this seamless environment where my, my phone, even though it doesn't know anything about my database, it can actually push my location into the database. And then I can pick that up from QGIS. And if you look on my um, example um, postings on osgs.cartoza.com, you'll see I've got a bunch of different analytic things that I've done with the data that comes with my phone. So it's really, really good for this kind of like um, ETL or data analytics um, things. And the other thing you can also do is you can have shell calls. So you could, for example, call GDAL or Ogre or something, um, passing it the payload and then getting the payload back out again. You can write to the file system. You can read from the file system. So it's pretty powerful about just being able to like code any kind of problem that you want that involves data processing with a, with minimal actual writing of code, just placing blocks on a on a layout. Any final Just to add, oh, to, yeah. Yeah. Okay. to add to that, I think, Tim, that uh, I think it is possible. I, I just did some light Googling about it. <laughs> but uh, there's the UI Builder framework for Node Red, which kind of tries to extend that. Um, okay. But I think it's still more, you know, one kind of back end state, you know, with people building dashboards. Um, but you, you can essentially build like multiple dashboards out that way, but it's not it's not trivial and it's not like part of the core framework. Yeah, and we've got some other toys that we can show you for for making dashboards which are like um, read only and public facing kind of things which we can look at metabase in a future session. And there's various other ones equivalent to metabase. What what metabase and the other sort of BI tools don't really give you is that interactivity where you can actually build widgets and forms and so on. And you can actually, if, if this was able to be isolated to like a per user session, it would be fantastic because you can really build a whole web application pretty trivially with forms and OK buttons and uh, you know, input widgets. You, you, can, you can spin up additional instances as well. Yeah, um, you could. But I don't I mean, think that's so can, viable if you've got like 1,000 users coming onto your system to spin up an instance yeah, for each so one. It would, be, it would be complex but doable. Yeah. Um, and you can also have separate dashboards, uh, Vicky. So I've seen some patterns where people like um, spin up the dashboard front end, like one, uh, with, like a password login and one without, or something like that. So you can also do some 
some tricks with your Docker orchestration to do that. Good. I'm going to wrap up the recording part. Any last words from you, Vicky, before we um, say goodbye to our adoring fans on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, if, uh, I'll just mention that I've done a write-up for the for how I got the displayed this workflow for the weather data and the display the air quality data. They'll be on the docs okay. pretty soon. Great. We can maybe put the link to that in the in the video, the YouTube video as well, so that people can find it from there as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So with that, I'll thank you very much, Vicky, for a great presentation. I'm going to stop the recording now, and goodbye to everybody watching. Thanks for tuning in.